My name is Terry Cakebread and I'm Vice President for Lucis North America, the finite element analysis software company, and I look after our business here. This is based on a paper I gave at the New York City Bridge Conference and was co-authored by my colleague Steve Rhodes. I would like to acknowledge his considerable input and I hope I'll be able to bring out the key issues from our paper single-handedly. This presentation concerns the rating and upgrading of steel bridges and the use of finite element modelling. Existing structures are tricky. We analyse them and give them a rating. Safety has to be the highest consideration here. No one wants to see what happened in Washington State happen in New York, but it's more complicated than just staying safe. Because if one in nine bridges needs work, that's going to mean a lot of dollars and a lot of disruption to the travelling public. We have to take each one case by case, and I expect the owners do just that. And of course, we're always asking more of our existing structures. Heavier trucks, faster trains, more lanes of traffic, Rating and upgrading go hand in hand, but it is just difficult work. We've got to consider the likely strengths of the materials and components which may have been installed many years ago to unfamiliar standards. There may be unusual details or modifications that have happened over the years, and we have to consider deterioration and damage. Because of such issues, some of the assumptions inherent in the existing ASHTO design rules may not be applicable. And furthermore, a lot of the conservative methods which may be okay for design might be too conservative for rating. And this is a key difference between design and rating. In the design of a new structure, being a little over conservative will have little effect on cost. Using number four bars instead of number three bars is actually not so much different. You've got all the same overheads, the same staff, the same equipment, bar bending requirements. The only difference is a few tons of steel. The conservative analysis or design may cost you, say, 5 or 10% more. In rating, when we say that number three bars are not enough, that could lead to millions of dollars of work. A better analysis, which proves they are OK, on the other hand, could mean no work, no disruption to the traffic, no river management, no demolition, no modification, no rebuilding, no cost. A less conservative analysis could make all the difference between a multi-million dollar job and no job at all. All of this means that a more refined analysis approach is justified. The Ashto Manual for Bridge Evaluation puts it like this. Evaluation seeks to verify adequate performance of existing bridges with an appropriate level of effort. Within a given ex evaluation procedure, the evaluator has the option of using simplified methods that tend to be somewhat conservative or pursue a more refined approach for improved accuracy. Let's look at the simplified method and more refined analysis options available. We'll go on to talk a little about supports and lastly, buckling. Steel bridges come in a wide range of structural arrangements some of the most common ones being half through pony girders, through truss, half through lattice girder, steel girders with a steel deck, and steel girders with concrete deck. And the way we analyse each will be very different, but I don't have time to talk in depth about all of them here. Some question marks hang over truss structures, which are generally modelled with global models, primarily using beam elements. It is worth noting that while these might be assumed pin for ultimate limit state assessment, when considering serviceability and fatigue criterion, it might be important to consider the likely real moment fixity between those truss members. And gusset plates may require local modelling, something we'll come to later. Since trusses are generally of low redundancy, sometimes the feeling is that we can't improve on a simple truss model. However, more elaborate models have been shown to be cost effective in rating work, for example, including shell elements to represent the deck and joint elements to allow for partial fixity at connections. Suction approach was used in the low rating of the 550 foot cut river bridge by Banesh 
for Michigan Department of Transportation. In this bridge, the truss supports a concrete deck with non-composite action via stringers and floor beams. A 3D FE analysis was found to distribute the loads more evenly than might have been assumed when using a simplified method, with concentrated vehicle loads being dispersed longitudinally as well as divided between the two trusses. The reduced live load forces in truss members eliminated the significant cost and disruption which would have arisen from a strengthening project. A similar approach helped for the M28 Octonagon River Bridge. Looking at half-through or pony girders, a very different approach would normally be appropriate. The interaction between the main girders and the cross girders, located down here by the bottom flange, is very important, particularly in buckling behaviour. So typically the girders will be represented using shell elements, although beam elements might be used for the cross members. Possibly joint elements could be used at the connections. But for all sorts of bridges, steel or concrete, Often the engineer's starting point is a simple global beam model. And a global beam model is certainly a useful thing. It can be a 2D model or a 3D model like this, which will then incorporate twisting effects. But whatever loads are applied, this model has the inbuilt assumption of perfect transverse distribution. That is to say, all parts of the cross section are involved in resisting the applied loads. It may be okay for certain structures, but it is, generally speaking, an upper bound or unsafe assumption. These models are, however, useful during rating, because if a perfect distribution gives a global failure, that is, the total load effect is greater than the total resistance, no amount of transverse redistribution will help. Some of the other assumptions need to be examined, and we'll come to that later. We should not confuse such a global beam model with a beam strip model. These consider a slice of structure, usually one unit or one beam width, taking the regionally applied load. These are lower bound models and are likely to be over conservative. In fact, the PCI bridge design manual tells us, refined methods of analysis may reduce the mid-span moment by 18 to 23% in the case of interior I-beams and by 4 to 12% for exterior I-beams when compared to the LRFD simplified method. The LRFD simplified method being the strip method. Now in rating especially, a 23% reduction in critical moments will be very much worth having. The refined analysis approach which is used will depend on the type of structure and the level of detail needed. It's about representing the true behavior of the structure to a level of accuracy which is justified by the purpose of the analysis. A variety of spaced beam and slab construction formats are used in bridge engineering, but for the purposes of selecting an analysis approach, they can be generally rationalized into three groups. Girders having a single web where cross bracing is not structurally significant in service, girders having a single web with cross bracing which is structurally significant in service, and girders having two or more webs, such as box beams. For all these, grillages or grid models are still very popular, perhaps because they are regarded as easy to understand. Grids certainly have a track record for a range of deck construction types. They produce forces and moments over a width specified at the outset. This helps with post-processing, post though it's sometimes the grillage modeler needs to be aware of when constructing the model. Setup is rapid using wizards in modern software and solution time is trivial on modern PCs. But we should be aware of some drawbacks. Most importantly, the recent NCHRP report 725 points out that the conventional 2D grid models used in current practice substantially underestimate the girder torsional stiffnesses in eye girder bridges, substantially misrepresents the cross frame responses, do, and they do not address 
the calculation of girder flange lateral bending in skewed eye girder bridges. The main alternative then is a 3D finite element model. For this for example, in this 3D finite element model, shell elements represent the slab and the girder webs, while the top and bottom flanges are represented using beams, which we show in this mauve colour in Lucis and green we use for shells. Stiffeners and cross bracing can also be represented using beam elements. The flanges could be represented using shell elements, however normally the inaccuracy arising from assuming that plane sections remain plane for each flange would be acceptable. This kind of 3D model is able to show the torsional warping effects illustrated here, where we see the stress in the girder is made up of an axial component, a vertical bending component, a lateral bending component, and finally the warping part where the top and bottom flanges are seen to be rotating in opposite senses. That kind of 3D model is what the Ashto commentary is describing when it says frequently the torsional warping degree of freedom is not available in beam elements. The Fala element method may be applied to a three-dimensional model of the superstructure. A variety of elements may be used in this type of model. The three-dimensional model may be made capable of recognising warping torsion by modelling each girder cross-section with a series of elements. That kind of 3D model may be really important in rating. But for cases where bracing is not significant, the skew or curve is low, a plate eccentric beam model may be used. The concept is simple. Beam elements represent the concrete girders, shell elements represent the concrete slab. The beam elements are given a cross-section with an eccentricity or offset and the slab a suitable thickness. This kind of model, model may be preferable to grillage modelling. It avoids some of the issues traditionally encountered in grid models and is very efficient in terms of modelling with modern analysis software. For box girders, full 3D models can be constructed, perhaps using a mixture of elements or as in this case, using only shell elements. Flint and Neil used a 3D finite element analysis for their rating and subsequent upgrade work on the Westgate Bridge in Melbourne, Australia. This single 3D finite element model was used for all the initial rating, new traffic loading and design of modifications, construction phases and construction loadings. Furthermore, the aim was to modify the existing structure. Here you can see that the 12 foot deep box girder section was to have the cantilevering wings, shown in red here, strengthened to allow for two more lanes of traffic. The same model incorporated critical details to remove the need for separate localised models. Here we see the anchorages for the cable stays within the box girder. So there are all these options for analysing the superstructure with simple models and 3D finite elements each having their place at various times. As bridge engineers we, need, we tend to focus our attention on the deck because often that's where the cost of the structure lies. But it, it's, it is important to, to devote as much care to the assessment of the stiffness of the supports and foundations as to the stiffness of the deck structure. Most simplified methods assume rigid supports and often engineers forget to re-evaluate support stiffness in line with the effort they are placing on the superstructure analysis. And the European Commission guideline for load and resistance of existing European railway bridges says the boundary conditions are often the parameter that has the greatest influence on the load carrying capacity when altered between possible limits. In many cases changes regarding the assumption of the boundary conditions can double or halve the load carrying capacity. So it is important to model these accurately. It's possible to model structures in their entirety taking account of the foundations. As was done here by Majeski and Masters. 
The integral nature of this bridge was important to its behaviour and Majeski built 3D models with spring supports and made detailed comparisons with observed data and other analysis approaches to validate their rating work. Here comparing the PAL deflection in Lucis with the Florida Pier program. Finally, using the models created for general low rating or upgrading purposes, we can tackle one of the specific problems for steel bridges, buckling. Central to most engineers' understanding of buckling is the Euler buckling load. Most familiar of all is the critical elastic buckling load in a pin-ended strut. Euler derived this formula from a differential equation describing the lateral deflection of the column, but there's actually an infinite number of solutions to that differential equation, reflecting the fact that the column can buckle in many modes. What we're familiar with is just the first solution because typically it's the lowest mode which is of interest, the lowest elastic buckling load. Now if Euler had been into matrices, he might have solved the problem differently, numerically. He would have told us that the eigenvalue of the stress stiffness matrix gives us the elastic buckling load. The elastic buckling load obtained by Euler's formula or by numerical means, such as using a finite element model and asking for an eigenvalue buckling solution, they are the same thing. They can be used interchangeably. It's important for engineers to have confidence in the solution by doing a very simple example and we can learn some things from that example. This is a pin-ended strut. It can't get much simpler than that. If we compare the Euler calculation with the result from a finite element eigenvalue buckling analysis, we get the same answer. You'd expect that. And just as in Euler's solution there are an infinite number of buckling modes, the same is true of our eigenvalue solutions but the one with the lowest elastic buckling load is generally the one of interest. Now the elastic buckling load is not the real failure load and this is because Euler considered a perfect strut with no residual stresses from its fabrication made of elastic material perfectly straight and with no consideration of any early deformations which might bring in some eccentricity to the loading condition. Perfection like that doesn't even exist in Switzerland where Euler was from and so the real failure load is lower than the elastic buckling load. Traditionally, we visualise this for struts of different slenderness using buckling curves like this one. The horizontal axis is slenderness and the vertical axis is buckling load. Slenderness is defined by the ratio yield stress over elastic buckling stress. For struts, this can be reduced to effective length over radius of duration. But at heart, the definition of slenderness is the same, yield over elastic buckling stress. If we know the slenderness value of a member, which is based on the elastic buckling load, we can read the real failure load from this empirically derived curve. The elastic buckling load might be found using one of the many formula given in section 6.9.4.1 or it may be found from an eigenvalue buckling analysis. It's essentially the same either way. From that point, once you have the elastic buckling load, you can use the codified formula to find the failure load. In the Eurocode, they don't give you any formula for elastic buckling loads at all. They figure that the engineer can find them in a textbook or use an eigenvalue buckling analysis. The principle is the same for long plates in compression. The slenderness is again defined as in terms of the elastic buckling stress. Ashto gives a general expression for elastic buckling stress of a plate where K is a coefficient which is a function of load and support conditions. Values of K may be obtained from textbooks for a limited number of conditions or alternatively the elastic buckling stress may be obtained using an eigenvalue buckling analysis. The beauty is that when we do this elastic buckling or eigenvalue buckling analysis, we can visualize and check the structural behavior, something we can't do with textbook formulae. 
It may be a local buckling failure, as we can see here in the top flange of these girders. It may be lateral torsional buckling failure. Notice how the buckling in this case is occurring between bracing locations, which is the assumption effectively when we use ash toe and we treat each girder individually. But what about this global instability? This global buckling of the girder system has traditionally been ignored because the system seems to be loaded so as to bend about its minor axis. The assumption is it will not buckle sideways because that is about the major axis of the entire system. Yet this type of failure can occur but it isn't explicitly covered by the current Ashto member resistance rules. So we've seen how the elastic buckling load or stress plugs into the code formula for member resistances and amplification factors and we can get that elastic buckling load from a finite element analysis instead of a textbook formula in which case these elastic buckling loads can be visualized and more importantly we can consider any cross section and structural layout any loading conditions any support conditions we can consider the member in the context of the whole structure. We can't get that kind of flexibility from textbook formula. But we can take finite element analysis further. In the Westgate Bridge upgrade described earlier, a local model was used to investigate buckling of the bulb flats, which found them to be largely adequate in spite of codified rules indicating otherwise. So this led to a reduction in strengthening works and cost. For this investigation, they used a nonlinear buckling analysis. Taking our simple strut example, we can carry out a nonlinear analysis and compare the predicted failure load with a member resistance from Ashto. An analysis like this needs to incorporate geometric nonlinearity, that is, large displacement theory and material nonlinearity that is yielding and hardening. But perhaps the important point that's easy to miss for an analysis like this is the imperfection. The column strength curves I showed earlier and the Ashto rules for columns assume an initial out of straightness of length over 1500. And in this example, if we use length over 1500 in our non-linear analysis, we agree the maximum load to within less than 1%. But if a larger initial out of straightness is assumed, we get a lower and lower maximum load. So it's important when considering a structure to use the appropriate initial imperfection. For bridge girders where lateral torsional buckling is a consideration, span over 300 would probably be a good starting point with reference to AISC 30310. This can lead to a large percentage reduction in capacity, in this case leading to over a 20% reduction and existing structures may not be fabricated or constructed to modern tolerances, so using Ashto rules for such structures could be unsafe. On the other hand, half-through pony girder bridges often suffer from low assessment ratings and this was the subject of a paper at the International Bridge Management Conference of 2005 where engineers from Gifford, now part of Ramble, applied a range of methods including non-linear analysis to save some bridges which have been identified as substandard as well as concluding that non-linear analysis gave a significant increase in load carrying capacity, they write, a restraint associated with the in-plane shear stiffness of the bridge deck exists in all half-through deck girder bridges that can be used through nonlinear finite element analysis to significantly increase bridge strength assessments. This restraint, which does not rely on moment continuity with the deck and is currently not recognized by design and assessment codes of practice has now been applied in the assessment of 30 bridges. This is an example of Lucis of 
in Lucis of a full non-linear analysis with the stars showing where the material yielding and the stress being shed onto other parts of the model. We're also ramping up the load to failure with heavily exaggerated deformations and you can actually see the plastic hinges forming. So clearly there is a considerable amount of benefit to be gained in improving the structural idealization used together with nonlinear analysis for structures of this sort. Alternatively, FE can be used to study unusual details such as, this, such as non-standard connections. Past studies have given good correlation with test results. And US consultants such as Gannett Fleming have used local models for things like gusset plates to determine their capacity and understand their likely modes of buckling failure. In summary, elastic critical buckling loads can be obtained from formula or from eigenvalue buckling analysis. The eigenvalue analysis approach is more flexible for variable cross-section types, curves, skews, support conditions and so on. Wherever they come from they can be plugged into member resistance rules. They can be used to help predict global buckling stability. Nonlinear analysis can provide an alternative to member resistance rules, particularly where the magnitude of imperfections is important. Material and geometric nonlinearity must be combined, and good agreements with codes of practice can be demonstrated. I've talked about a range of modeling option, options, including global and local models the importance of supports and in some detail about buckling analysis in the context of rating and upgrade work. With its extra lanes and 574 extra props and all that analysis, global models, local models, buckling models and so on, the Westgate Bridge upgrade won the top title at the National Civil Contractors, Contractors Federation Earth Awards for projects over $75 million and the Australian Engineering Excellence Award in 2011. Maybe that's some inspiration for bridges closer to home. Clearly the public are in a hurry for their new bridge. We must use all the tools at our disposal for managing our ageing bridge stock, ensuring they are safe, have the capacity and width, and keep the costs and disruption to a minimum. Thank you for your attention.